Yeah. Hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome everywhere around the globe. We have a very fantastic audience today um, and also panel stretching from north to south and from east to west. Um, yeah, so in today's online forum, IELTS online forum, we'll be talking about the quantitative turn in English linguistics. And uh, aside from myself, Martin Schweinberger, I'm a um, lecturer in applied linguistics at the University of Queensland in Australia. I have with me uh, Tove Larsen from the University uh, of Northern Arizona. Uh, we have with us uh, Laura Yanda from the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø and Stefan Gries from the University of California, Santa Barbara and the Justic Justus Liebig University University in Gießen. So welcome everybody. Uh, just to give you a short introduction about what today's topic uh, is. So when we look at linguistics and the last 30, 40 years, we see that there has been an increase in the use of quantitative methods to analyze language data. And we can see that basically these quantitative approaches have become more and more prevalent and today we'll talk about that quantitative turn. We want to talk about basically what that development means, also what issues it brings with us, uh, it brings with it, and also we want to think about uh, what the future might be in terms of methodology. So um, without further ado, I'd like to hand over to the panelists for short introductions uh, of themselves, and we'll start with Tova. Thank you so much, Martin. <clears throat> thank you so much for, for organizing, hosting, and thank you everyone for coming. So I actually prepared some slides here just because that's how I organized my thoughts. So I'll go ahead and share. And move this. So just double checking, you can see my slides, right? Is that right? Yeah, perfect. Perfect, great. Okay. So uh, Martin asked us to introduce ourselves very quick and talk about why we were um, invited and also what our views are on uh, the quantitative turn and all this in, in five minutes. So here we go. So my name is Tove Larsen. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of applied linguistics at Northern Arizona University. Uh, before that, I was a postdoc at UC Levan and also at NEU. Um, and before that, I was at Uppsala University. So this is me kind of in the academic world, but then I think it's important to remember that we all have lives outside of academia too. So my life outside of academia is, is mostly rock climbing. Okay, so uh, why might I be relevant for the discussion then? And um, Martin didn't explicitly tell me, so this is my, my best <laughs> guess here. Um, so I am very interested in quantitative research methods. Um, I use them in my research. I uh, have published some uh, recent studies um, with co-authors uh, co where I try to help spread some, some methods that might be helpful for the field. So I'm for quantitative methods in that I'm in favor of quantitative methods, but um, I'm also for linguistic rigor and focusing on the language that is um, behind or underneath the, the numbers. And I don't think that anyone would say that they're against <laughs> linguistics or anything like that. So why am I mentioning this? And the reason is that uh, my collaborators and I uh, did a study where we um, saw this tension or potential tension between the two. So, um, and more about that in the next slide. So. I'm setting up this kind of false dichotomy. No, there's an actual um, dichotomy here that we, we should perhaps be, be aware of. So my views then briefly on the quantitative turn, um, very brief background and a bit of a caveat here that uh, this is from the perspective of corpus linguistics, which is what I do uh, mostly. So um, can't necessarily be generalized to, to all subfields of linguistics or anything like that. Um, so in the study, we looked at the results, discussion, and conclusion sections of um, empirical studies in the main corpus linguistics journals in 2009 and 2019. And in 2009, we saw a preference for uh, linguistic description, interpretation, over statistical reporting. And then in 2019, we saw this huge shift where all of a sudden the opposite was true. Um, and the way we operationalized uh, linguistic description was that this would require linguistics training. So this is prose that would require a linguist um, and statistical reporting 
is uh, prose that does not require linguistics training. So this could have been done by, by a statistician or someone with uh, um, quant statistical training. Um, so aren't we just kind of witnessing increased methodological sophistication in the field? Isn't that a good thing? Uh, well, potentially, but it seems to have come at a bit of a cost. And that's what we saw in the study that we saw a diminished focus on linguistic description and interpretation. Uh, but not only that, we also saw a fewer text excerpts, fewer linguistic examples, and uh, we're moving, it seems, away from our data, meaning language, meaning language examples and linguistic features and so on. Um, so that's potentially then problematic. So am I saying that the quant turn uh, is a bad thing? Well, it doesn't have to be, and let's maybe make sure it doesn't turn into to a bad thing or more of a bad thing. Um, and I think it's important to recognize and remember that those of us who do quantitative linguistics um, do quantitative stuff. <laughs> so we need uh, statistical rigor for research questions that require it. Um, and we always need linguistic uh, rigor for, for this to work. So how can we do, this is the last slide, uh, what can we do to safeguard both? So for both of them training, I'm personally really grateful to people like Stefan who take the time to um, offer training and so on to, to the field. And then of course, uh, linguistics training through our programs and so on. Um, we want to make sure, I would argue, that we don't go overboard with our methods. So um, if our research question requires an advanced method, yes, by all means. If it doesn't, which is often the case, then um, we can often find something that is is uh, more um, simpler, that would be uh, more suitable for, for our study so that we don't kind of go over, overboard. And of course, keep in mind that statistics can't fix problems if we have issues with our data collection, our um, our coding and so on. Um, sure, we can run stats, but we're going to get wacky results. Uh, it won't fix any problems. Um, and also, we can't all be experts at everything. So if we're not that interested in, in statistical methods, for example, in, in quantitative methods, then um, maybe we can team up with someone who is and, and work in that way. Um, same for linguistic rigor, we need careful study design. Um, we have this saying of garbage in, garbage out, uh, goes for linguistics as well. And we always want to make sure that we interpret our results and um, statistical or otherwise uh, to make sure that they are um, linguistically interpretable and also to make sure that we, we uh, draw conclusions about linguistics. Uh, we're, we're linguists by training, not um, anything else. And again, uh, there are I'm sure a lot of areas that we're not experts at. So um, collaboration could be really helpful there. And that's it for me. Yeah, thanks, Tom. That was fantastic. Um, now I'd like to uh, ask Laura to tell us why I invited her. <laughs> I thought you could tell me, but okay, uh, I'll I'll give it a try. Um, thank you very much. Um, and I guess I, I can I can name a few things off of my CV here. So for one thing, I edited a book in two thousand and thirteen, which was called uh, Quantitative Well Cognitive Linguistics: The Quantitative Turn, um, in which uh, we uh, represented articles from the Journal of Cognitive Linguistics. And uh, I also had an introduction there where I talked about um, about what were uh, typical statistical models we could use in linguistic uh, in 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 work in quantitative linguistics, and um, and uh, also I addressed some of these questions that uh, Tova just uh, brought up. Uh, we also found at that time, looking back, we also went looking back at the articles in. Um, in the journal Cognitive Linguistics, and that there was there was there was literally a quantitative turn at almost exactly mm -hmm. the same. Time. I think it was around two thousand eight that uh, mm -hmm. suddenly the majority of articles were actually involved some sort of quantitative work. Um, I'm also the founder of uh, the Trimso Repository of Language and Linguistics, which we call Trolling. Um, in two thousand fourteen, we're going to be celebrating our tenth anniversary this year. Um, and I, uh, I encourage everybody to use this. This is a professionally curated and, and managed uh, uh, archive where you can put your data and your code for your statistical models, uh, all kinds of ancillary materials. It's not a place to put corpora, but you know the data behind a given article, for example. Um, 
And actually, part of the reason I did this was for completely selfish reasons, so that I could, I could again, find my own data and code. Um, and now other people can, can find it. And, and it's a, a place where we can, um, it's a place where we can ensure that we are following the FAIR principles, which we'll probably get back to later about findable, ac accessible, interoperable, and uh, reusable. Um, I also uh, in at uh, U at my university UIT the Arctic University of Norway in 2015 I designed and launched a quantitative methods in linguistics MA level course, which uh, had not previously existed, and in 2017. I was named the uh, the Open Data Champion for the Spark European Open Data Showcase. Um, I've also written a number of articles that use quantitative methods, but I have to admit that you know I I really got started with all this stuff only in 2007. I don't really consider myself to be a great expert in quantitative methods, and I'm I'm maybe more of a learner. And and follow her along. And I'm extremely grateful to others who have helped me to learn, especially Harold Bay and Martin, and especially Stefan Gries, who's been extremely generous in, in teaching uh, people about, uh, about use of quantitative methods. Um, and, and I guess as a, like a parting idea, because we were supposed to also share thoughts and evaluation of the quantitative turn, can, maybe I can share the um, comment that uh, sent me on my quantitative turn. And it was, I was at a conference of the International Cognitive Linguistics Conference in, um, in uh, Poland in 2007. And I remember that uh, Dirk Gerards was giving a plenary lecture and he said, it's great to count things, but you must think about what you are counting. And and I was the I was the only person in like in in, a, in an audience of like four hundred who broke out, broke out laughing, but <laughs> but uh, but it, I don't know it's something that fell deep into me and that kind of launched me on my way. So thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, yeah, I think when I invited you, I had different different ideas in mind for every one of you, right? Um, yeah, and. Let's talk about that a little bit later. So, Stefan, uh, you're next. So tell us All about right. yourself and what you think about quantitative turn. All right. So, yeah, thanks a lot to, uh, to you, Martin, for organizing this and for inviting me. Uh, I'm not sure completely why I'm invited. I, so I'm a quantitative corpus linguist. Uh, I have quite some interests in quantitative statistical methods, uh, their development, uh, their critique, uh, and their teaching. Um, theoretically, I guess I do mostly like usage-based kind of work, uh, cognitive linguistic, if one wants to call it that way still. Um, and I dabble to some extent in computational and psycholinguistics. Um, <clears throat> I've, uh, yeah, most of my work is quantitative. Uh, I guess I do try to bring the linguistics always along, but um, there is certainly a heavy methodological focus. Um, <clears throat> I've uh, written a textbook on statistical methods uh, and linguistics. Uh, last edition came out like two years ago or so. So I, I think I do have a pretty heavy stake in, in that kind of stuff, or at least a pretty heavy interest in it. Um, uh, in terms of the quantitative turn, um, <laughs> it's, it's tricky. <laughs> so obviously not all work needs to be quantitative. Um, so, I mean, there there is clearly a place for qualitative work. I mean, no doubt about that. Uh, I have no difficulties in admitting that. Um, at the same time, um, I do welcome the quantitative turn um, uh, because I think for a lot of things that we want to do in linguistics, not all of them, right? But for a lot of things, I, I do think it's necessary. Um, uh, I, I think without any kind of quantification, uh, even verbalizing descriptive results uh, may be way more difficult than it could be. Uh, certainly that also holds for uh, or applies to comparing uh, different results. Um, and it's, I think in a lot of cases, understanding the quantitative aspects of a study and what methods to use there is especially important when it comes to determining what is likely important and what is likely unimportant variability in the data that we constantly face. Um, in addition, um, I think that in order to understand multifactorial and multivariate scenarios, uh, basically quantitative methods are indispensable. I mean, 
there's no way we can look at the kinds of data and the sizes of data and the complexities that we currently often face uh, and sort of summarize them by eyeballing, uh, you know, talking about what impressions we have and stuff like that without quantification. I don't think this is possible. And this is where it maybe gets a slightly bit more polemic, but then I'll also shut up. Um, so I do think the quantitative aspect is particularly important for two reasons. Uh, so one is, uh, you know, when we want to generalize, right? I mean, it's perfectly fine to do very qualitatively oriented case studies, um, maybe descriptions of things coming with uh, maybe speculative or hypotheses, explanations and stuff like that. But I do think that as soon as one wants to generalize, uh, this idea of uh, separating the wheat from the chaff, you know, the important variability in the data and the unimportant one um, becomes paramount. And that can, I think, pretty much not be done without quantitative methods. Uh, and so I think in most cases, as soon as generalizability is, an, is part of the goals uh, of the study, I think quantification needs to be done. <clears throat> Second, uh, I don't have a great example for this, but um, I, I also think quantification is necessary because uh, it strikes me that, um, to start off on a polemic note, you know, that a lot of people who are against quantification, um, they are only against quantification uh, when it's in linguistics and in their field. And I'm not going to be so arrogant to speculate on what the reasons might be, uh, but let me just put out this thing as a as a maybe thought provoking uh, statement, uh, I do think we all want the best quantification and the most thorough statistical analysis possible when it comes to vaccine research, uh, all sorts of other health stuff, uh, whether radioactivity will fry the kindergarten that your child goes to because it's next to the nuclear power plant, right? Then everyone, even the most uh, quantification hating linguist would say gee you know i want to i want you to throw every possible method at this to figure out uh, what's going on there because gee this is pretty damn important right and yet at the same time a lot of people uh, in 2024 you know sign off on the ill advised chi square test on summary data that has no place there and you're like, well, gee, you know, you want, you have these high standards for this stuff that is really important. But here you're like, well, you know, description is great too. And I don't really need to generalize. I think that's a double standard that often, at least not always, again, there is a place for qualitative work, but in many cases, I think it's a double standard that is ill-advised and that we cannot afford. That doesn't mean uh, I completely agree with Hober there. You know, of course we shouldn't go overboard. Of course we need the linguistic rigor. Right. I mean, I'm. I think I'm in way more agreement with my predecessors here than it sounds like. Um, but I do think that you know everybody often needs to look at you know where do I demand quantitative standards very much, and gee, why isn't my own work on that list? And with that happy thought, I I finish my in initial statement. Yeah. So so you you've already touched on the question that I'd like that I wanted to ask you, right? Which which is um, given that there has been this quantitative turn, as Tova and colleagues have shown, as Lula has basically looked at, and Ben Cartman as well, right? So why? Why has there been this quantitative turn, right? And you've already addressed it. You said, well, it's about generalizability and um, you know other factors like interactions, the ability to rank things, right? What other or what 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 other factors do you think are at work? When you when you think about why there has been this quantitative term, Laura, what what it, what do you think? Yeah, so I think the big factors here, of course, is uh, just the internet, internet, and the kind of explosion of um, available data, um, and also the um, I don't know the uh, the uh, scaling up of. Um, of computer strength and as well, and also accessibility of R, which I mean the mm. the R and R markdown, all these packages. I mean, all of these things kind of came together in more or less the same same time frame, at least as as I see it. Um, yeah, so maybe I'll I'll just leave it there. Mm. Mm. So essentially, the perfect storm, right, of uh, Stefan's introduction to statistics and how that binds and R, R being, you know 
being available to people and around. Yeah, yeah, true. And also corpora, uh, corpora right? That they were around, so more, more people used it, right? So you're training, yeah. Tova, what do you think? Thank you. And sorry about disappearing there for a second. We lost yeah. connections in the in the building, so I was on my phone for a second here, but I'm back. So I'm yeah. sorry, I missed part of, of Stefan's introduction, but um, I did hear him saying um, that we kind of need quantitative methods, and I fully agree in that we have, so in corpus linguistics, we have, you know, thousands, millions of sometimes tokens, at least texts, and, and so on. Um, we can't just kind of eyeball it and say, okay, well, this looks, you know, like there's a pattern here and so on. We need help, essentially. Um, and of course, uh, inferential statistics uh, to be able to generalize beyond our sample and, and so on. Um, just that our data is somewhat or somewhat different from, from other fields where um, at least for corpus linguistics, maybe less so for, you know, psycholinguistics and so on, where they look at um, uh, reaction times and so on, where there's actually, they are like numeric variables and so on. Whereas for us, like we'll go all the way down and there's an adverb or there's a, a noun phrase, or there's a, um, you know, a, a, a genitive or something like that. So when we move all the way down, it's like, well, this is, <laughs> this is not a number. So anytime we even take a mean of something we're we're abstracting away from, from our data, um, and so, I, yes, we, we probably need to, um, to make sense of it and to be able to compare and so on. But um, I, I think we also need to remember that we are a slightly different field uh, from other fields um, that, that deal more with, with actual numeric data. Actually, that was one. So um, you said that I didn't tell you why I invited you, right? So one reason why I invited you is because I think you and your group, you manage very well to strike a very good balance oftentimes between qualitative, interpretative, and quantitative. So that's that's one reason why I wanted to have you have you on. Um, yeah, so right. Now this is kind of polemic or a little bit tricky, right? Let me play devil's advocate. And uh, let me ask Laura first, and I'd like to hear your response or your idea about it, uh, Stefan. Could it be the case that we've gone too far in certain ways with quantifying quantifying language in certain ways? What do you think, Laura? I mean, I'm going to mm -hmm. rephrase that slightly and ask, is it possible to go too far? I mean, mm -hmm. what would it look like to go too far? And and I can think of various ways in which uh, in which we can uh, we can go a little too far. So one thing I think Tova mentioned a little bit is also what kind of models do we use? You know, some models are much more kind of comprehensible and accessible to people, and uh, and but some appear really as black boxes, and some are black boxes. You know, even even for uh, very proficient users of statistical models, and it's it's sometimes it's hard to say. You know, is are the are black box type analyses or things that appear as black boxes are they really comprehensible how much do they really add to a, to uh, an analysis um another thing is something that also tova was mm -hmm. touching on a little bit but i mean it's not just linguistic science or it's not something particular about linguistics that is um um that that isn't based directly on on quantifiable items because actually all science is Anytime, anytime you have you have data, it's human beings who collected that data and put it in there somewhere. So there's there's always a, a degree of human um, there's always a degree of like human artifacts, and and I, so so this is another thing we have to worry about is um, are we going to are, we have to keep track of what is uh, what are artifacts you know how the data was coded. Um, are there other artifacts of, of of hard and software that that might be in the data? Um, and also, um, how artificial is the um, uh, is the research question? How artificial is the task that we're that we're looking at? Because if we get a, very far away from uh, natural language, spontaneous, authentic natural language, what uh, what does our study really tell us? about language and mm -hmm. um and and also uh that you know ultimately your research questions aren't going to come straight out of a a um a quantitative i mean analysis they require interpretation 
and theory and introspection. I mean, so we always need to have some sort of a healthy balance between uh, quantitative and qualitative in introspection. So I, I'm thinking more about like, these should be the guardrails. And um, part of how to keep these guardrails in, in place is also to follow the best practices of science. And this lends integrity to our field and to uh, to follow the the so-called fair princ principles and uh, and and these will help us to safeguard against uh, both fraud and junk science, if you will. So maybe I'll leave it there. Stefan, do you think we need guardrails? Uh, well, so um, I actually don't think. I think the question sort of has a perspective that I would want to modify. I mean, your question, you know, so I don't, in a sense, I don't think, uh, you know, we can go too far with quantifying language. The, um, the, the question is, you know, do we, given what we did with our quantification, you know, are we still going far enough with a linguistic interpretation of them? Uh, mm -hmm. Right. I do think uh, kind of like what I mentioned earlier, you know, I do think that most questions probably, uh, <clears throat> probably require much more complicated statistical modeling than actually we often use now. Um, because like I said, you know, there, there is, I don't think there, there's hardly any question anymore where a simple statistical uh, analysis of a monofactorial, you know, chi-square t-test kind of uh, version is still extremely useful given that we know so much by now that for nearly everything we look at, you know, we do need control variables and that means multifactoriality. Right. And so so the problem to me is not, uh, you know, like, uh, gee, the sun is now. Let me put the light back on. <laughs> so I think I think the problem is is not that, you know, we go so far with quantification, uh, we overshoot the mark. I think with quantification, we may actually I mean, I know this is not a popular opinion, but I, I think we may need to actually even go further than we're going now. We just need to make sure that the linguistic uh, analysis and, and interpretation and stuff like that follow suit, right? That's yeah. the whole point. So of course, I don't want a discrepancy. You know, I just don't want it either way. You know, I don't want the quantitative stuff to go ahead and then no linguistics follows it. But I also don't want, you know, a ton of linguistic speculation when we have data and the quantitative methods don't follow suit accordingly, right? Um, but I think it's, um, I, I'm trying to be short here too, but uh, I think it's, um, I don't have a good word for this. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I agree with this. You know, well, linguistics is special in the sense, and you know, we move too far away from our data if we quantify too much, because a, I don't think linguistics is special there, uh, and second, uh, the use of quantification alone doesn't guarantee that we move too far away, right? So. Um, uh, just to give one or two examples, like, and I mean, I think uh, the best comparable science in the sense or quantitative science for us is ecology and not psychology. And, you know, in ecology, everyone could also say, you know, uh, as soon as you use these quantitative methods, you're going away from the individual rabbit whose body temperature I measured in this particular situation, right? You can always say that. I mean, it's a pseudo mm -hmm. argument. You can always make up some stuff where you say, oh, now it's too remote. You know, but still, ecologists do studies on populations of rabbits because they need to figure out, you know, how do they fit in this habitat? Are they becoming a nuisance for agriculture or whatever? You know, I, I don't know anything. But, you know, just to say. So, again, the point is, you know, does the question you ask, does it require generalization? Uh, you know, and then I think you have to move away from the individual parts. Of course, you need to bring it back to maybe individual predictions and stuff like that to interpretation. Again, I'm not debating any of this, uh, you know, especially not with my co-panelists. Um, but this idea like, well, linguistics is kind of special and, you know, we need to stick closer to the data. You know, other sciences don't have that problem, right? And again, the COVID vaccine thing, right? You, you, want, you want pharmaceutical companies to be able to generalize and not just say what their vaccine candidate did to this 60 year old guy living in rural Ohio who had this comorbidity. You want general statements. Why would linguistics be any different? I don't see it. And so again, last sentence, you know, I do want the, I do want the match of the quantitative part and the interpretational part, uh, but I do think uh, we can't 
we can't achieve that match by reducing the quantitative uh, to the level that is palatable for someone who wants linguistic interpretation. Uh, I, uh, I reviewed so many papers that did a chi-square test that would actually require a mixed effects model because mm. there is speaker variation, right? So the, the answer is not, I don't want to move too far away. Let me do the chi-square test because then all my great interpretation will sway you. The answer is no. You have repeated measurement data. Do this stupid model, maybe with a collaborator, but then make sure the interpretation you know, is at the same level of sophistication. Mm. Yeah. Before, before I ask Tova uh, to respond, um, let me let me uh, just advertise for next month event real quick, because there we actually have a look at basically a potential future of quantification, because we'll talk about AI and large language models and how it relates to linguistics. So uh, next month, March uh, 20, uh, we'll talk about that, but it will be a different time slot. Um, it's just too late for me here. So Tobo, based on based on uh, what Stefan said, right? I mean, he responded to you in a way, but would you be able to to say something or speculate about the future and uh, think about the the future of quantitative methodology in linguistics? Um, sure, yeah, that's a <clears throat> big question. But uh, and also, sorry, I'm having the same issues as Stefan in terms of having the sun come and, and go and whatever is early in the morning here. Um, so just to uh, to clarify that I'm not or and we uh, the the group of co-authors here uh, we're not saying we should never um, quantify we should never move away from language just that like you said Stefan we should return <laughs> to language we should return to the rabbit um, after um, to make sure that we we make whatever conclusions we draw um, are applicable to to the language data and so on so um, not saying we should never move away and and yes I fully agree that there are a lot of questions that require more than, than chi-square and so on. Um, so, and the actual question, uh, Martin, so the future of, <laughs> of quant, what was the question, sorry? Yeah, well, Spell, where, where do you think um, this turn is going? It's really just, you know, just, we're having a conversation, no one expects you to be uh, correct or predict the future. But uh, based on based on what you think, what would you speculate where uh, where the quantitative methodology is taking us? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think we have a very exciting few years ahead of us uh, in this respect, and I think we will. I'm I'm hoping at least that we'll see more um, kind of more balance because I think when when uh, methods, because according to, to our study, then this is a fairly recent shift in, at least in corpus linguistics, that we, uh, you know, 2009 wasn't that long ago, and then all of a sudden we see we see a change. So um, I think when new methods and when new degrees of sophistication and so on come into field, I think it's easy to get a little bit carried away maybe with, with the methods. And then I think in the next few years, we'll see um, more of a balance between uh, statistics and linguistics and I hope at least that will so I think we're really good as a field in general um, to hold ourselves to really high standards for you know reviewers for for journals and so on um, for to really high standards when it comes to statistical rigor that you're not gonna you know hopefully get away with things that you shouldn't get away with but I would love if we could love it if we could have equally high, if not higher standards for the linguistic rigor, uh, just making sure that we do a really good job with, you know, the manual coding, uh, automated um, tagging with uh, data collection, with things that I think we could really work harder at um, as a field. Um, and then of course, also the, the quantitative methods and the, um, the statistics so that there is no um, dichotomy between the two that that in a sense that we're you know we have both we have the linguistic rigor we have the, the statistical rigor um, so that we can answer questions that we haven't been able to to answer before. Great Stefan really quick because I want to call on Laura as well. Yeah uh, just a quick follow-up um, and basically I wanted to second this so uh, I, I do think it's um, it's really important to uh, you know do this at the right pace Right. Just to give an example, and this this is not a critique of anyone in particular. Um, I uh, like when Harold's book came out in two thousand eight. You know, it had this. Um, it basically introduced. You know, the the seventh chapter introduced mixed effects modeling, uh, and then 
there were a few years during which uh, in some journals, you know, like language and whatever, suddenly people pushed everything, you know, needed to be a mixed effects model because that's the new thing. Right. And um, mm. I personally, you know, even when I did the second edition of my stats book in 2013, I still didn't include them because I actually felt like, gee, you know, this is all not really fully, you know, thought through and stuff like that. And we didn't. And at the time, you know, we didn't have the papers then that now everyone is citing, you know, what is a maximal random effect structure, you know, the bar at mm. all to check it all work. And I'm not saying this to say, like, you know, I'm the greatest. I had the balance. I'm just saying. You know, I do think we need to keep examples like this in mind. You know, if there's a new method, I mean, yeah, we should we should look at it. Uh, you know, but I think in you know in that time window, 2009 to 2013, you know, I do think a lot of people rushed it, mm -hmm. uh, and I think there's a, a whole yeah. bunch of analyses out there right now that, given what we've what we've found out only a few years later, you know, maybe shouldn't have been done that way, but were pushed pre prematurely on a field that you know wasn't ready for it. So I completely mm -hmm. second Tova's view there. Hmm. Laura? Yeah, I have a, a warning and a hope <laughs> about the future. My warning about the future is that um, just a few weeks ago, their article, an article came out uh, that showed that uh, already 57.1% of language on the internet is not written by human beings. It's machine generated. And and in this kind of in this new world uh, that we're going into, where most of the language on the on uh, on the internet will will be machine generated, um, the importance of of curated corpora is is greater than ever, and mm -hmm. and so this is going to be one of our great challenges to, is to make sure that what we are analyzing is uh, the language of human beings, unless what we want to analyze is the language of machines. That's also that's also a possibility. But mm -hmm. I mean, this is something that we should we should keep in mind because because this is this, this is a trend that's accelerating. And my my hope for the future. I hope that linguists could also get credit for posting their data sets and their statistical code mm -hmm. in publicly archived places like trolling. Um, because I think that, you know, if you do this in a responsible way, it's it's almost as much work or maybe as much work as as uh, writing and publishing an article. Uh, so we should one should get one should get credit for it. And in this way, linguists have an opportunity also to contribute to the community because these are resources that, that can then be reused. And this is a way for us to share and learn from each other. Amen. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Uh, I completely agree, of course. And I have lots of things to say about um, what I think, where we're going. But I'd like to close this section of the online panel off. Um, we'll stop the recording now, and then we'll uh, take questions from the audience. So thanks so much to the panelists so far, and I'll stop the recording now, and we'll...